Welcome, Rogers viewers. Today we're in the studio with uh, Nadine Robitaille, and I'm going to introduce her in a few minutes. But first, I want to say thank you um, to the Rogers team. Without Rogers volunteers, we wouldn't have community programming, and I wouldn't be able to be here to discuss um, health matters and mental wellness throughout the developmental lifespan. So today we're talking about adolescence, the, the developmental phase of adolescence, and the impact of anxiety and depression on adolescents in our communities. And I'm so lucky to have Nadine here, Thanks who I've me. had the privilege of knowing for many, many years. I think what we, I was trying to figure out this morning, probably 15, maybe, yeah. maybe yeah. a little more, around a little there, less. a little more maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and Nadine said my at my path crossed in the, working in child welfare. Nadine is also a child and youth care practitioner, as I was when we both started our careers mm -hmm. and uh, both of us ended up in the play therapy world. We did. Yeah. Yep. So how did you get involved in play therapy? How did that work for you in terms of your journey? Yeah, of helping? so I think um, it was just an evolution that, yeah. that uh, working with adolescents and trying to figure out different ways to engage because don't very often have adolescents coming through the door saying, yay, I want to sit down and talk to you about therapy and all the things that are bothering me. So or uh, I, all the issues that I've been having or the, right. the choices that I've been making that are getting into trouble, exactly. I think I want everybody sitting down looking at me while yeah. we process that. Exactly. Yeah. So play just was a really great fit um, in terms of being able to engage and, and develop relationships. And uh, so it was exciting. Um, and I think my child and youth background yeah. certainly lent way to you know that whole basis of relationship building and therapeutic activities and therapeutic engagement and so it was just a really nice it was a nice fit um, but you don't just you're not just a play therapist you do lots of other things with families I do I yeah. do so lots of work um, in helping psych ed work uh, helping parents to understand sort of the issues and because um, it's, it's challenging it's challenging for parents to sort of get um, and then challenging for the kids then to understand why does mom and, not, mom and dad not get it. Um, so lots of work with families. So when you say psych ed, you mean uh, psychoeducation around right. what challenges are yeah, and supports? Yeah, what the challenges are, what are the supports, how do you navigate some of the systems. Sometimes the systems can be a challenge to be able to navigate. Like um, school systems. School systems, mental health systems. Yeah. Um, how do you access uh, therapists? How do you access um, psychologists, psychiatry if needed? Um, we don't come with a handbook. No, <laughs> You're, unfortunately. It's actually, in earlier shows we've had, I should tell you, we've had, um, um, we, you know, talked about in our in at earlier segment around resiliency model and looking at the circle of courage around how do we, you know, pump up our kids and yeah. our communities in terms of um, ensuring people have a sense of belonging and they have opportunities to gain mastery yeah. and independence, and then finally generosity in terms of we have to be. We want to be codependent and co-supportive in a healthy way Absolutely. with each other. And so many families in our Peel region are really isolated Absolutely. versus having the resources that they need Absolutely. to get things done. And we also had, uh, we've had uh, in previous segments, had a birth doula talk about the impact of postpartum depression nice. on attachment yep. with, between parent and child, and as well as anxiety and depression in children. So anxiety and depression in teenagers, though, um, I think if I just asked someone on the street what might that look like if they're not connected with teenagers, they go, I don't know. Um, we hear a lot about ch adolescent suicide. Yep. Uh, we hear a lot about self-harming. Uh, we hear a lot about First Nations communities that are really struggling in other parts of Ontario yep. with accessing resources. But um, also in our region, it's hard for families to know, okay, at what point do I need to seek, seek at what point does this not just adolescent struggle and angst and really right. we need to get some support here before things Absolutely. go south really fast. And I think that's one of the challenges with adolescents because when we look at sort of what are the signs and the symptoms of anxiety and depression, lots of times they mirror sort of that natural or normal right. stage and age of development right and so absolutely is this sort of a normal teenage adolescent thing or 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 is there is there a challenge here um, and I think that combination in combination with uh, adolescence resistance absolutely um, <laughs> which is normal at that age regardless of whether right. anxiety or depression but then the whole stigma of mental health and what that means for them in terms of adolescence and that need to not be different and to belong 
Um, and then the challenges for parents in terms of the feelings that come along with the shame and the guilt of... Yeah, it, you've just hit that right. I mean, I, I've talked to so many parents in my own practice where they didn't recognize at first as, as anxiety, it was defiance, Absolutely. right? Like my child's being really difficult. Yeah. Uh, we had a really close relationship. I feel like we've, you know, they yeah. disengaged Absolutely. or... Or they're lazy. They're lazy, yeah. They can't, yes. that's a big one, that's they're lazy. That's a huge one. And then combine that with a parent who may have additional responsibilities and stress and feels right. like they've, through all of the many responsibilities in the family yep. haven't been the kind of parent that they want to yep, be. Absolutely. Um, you know, yep. it's getting them over the, okay, we're going to help you with your stuff, but let's deal with this stuff exactly. first. Exactly. So it's those, all of those factors that I think um, makes it uniquely challenging at this age and stage of development. Um, so how, Nadine, and now, and what we haven't shared with the viewers is that you're also a therapist, but you also have a, a program called Carry On, yes. and you have other therapists that you supervise that work That's with correct. you. So if I phone you and say, you know, my daughter's refusing to go to school or, or you know, not, you know, not contributing to the household, not getting out of bed, right. um, how would you match my child up with one of your therapists? It's a really good question. So usually when we get a phone call, it's exactly around that. It's exactly around the behaviors, um, not attending school, not right. getting out of bed in the morning, not listening. Um, sometimes substance issues start to become, start to become yeah, a huge sure. challenge. So the kids are, so, and it's not that they're necessarily, well, they are getting into drugs and it's so widely available, but huge. it's also self-medicating, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And when we say that, maybe you can explain what that is, because I don't think that's a concept that not a lot of families are aware of. For sure, for sure. And again, it's that developmental age and stage of, you know, it's not abnormal for adolescents to be experimenting. And, right. and um, but for a lot of children that struggle with anxiety and depression, it does become a way of, I need this in order to be able to function. Right. So um, instead of so getting, going to the doctor and getting medication, exactly. they're kind of masking their symptoms Absolutely. and feelings. But and it's just, far more socially acceptable with our peer group sure is. Um, to be going and, and using a substance uh, that the rest of my peers are using as opposed to taking a medication. Um, so I think the difference in terms of the substance usage becomes it becomes necessary in order to function as opposed to something that is just for recreational um, sort of normal age and stage of, of development for, for typical adolescents, whatever, whatever that looks like. So now. when you do your intake and you hear that maybe substance use is part of the process, part of, of how the child is, the yeah. teen is coping, um, what would be other kind of questions I would expect you to ask? I would be looking for frequency. Okay. Um, so frequency, intensity in all areas. So I, I think anxiety is normal. Um, in terms of feeling not, not nervous. Not many people say that, but you're right. It, it, I, it, yeah. Being yeah. here, anxious, right? Yeah. <laughs> Someone asked me on the way here about, and said, so what smart. does anxiety look like? I said, this is what anxiety looks like, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, but think, you know, a test, writing an exam, asking somebody out, um, the way I look today, all of those things, mm -hmm. you know, the, there's, there's normative um, levels of, of anxiety. You know, a breakup, uh, all of those things will create will cr create depression. So so those feelings of sadness and nervousness are 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 certainly normal. Right. Um, and and many of us would argue healthy on some level. Absolutely. Um, if you manage them. If you manage them. Right. Um, so so when when families call and say my child's struggling, we always want to take a look at what is the intensity, what is the frequency, mm -hmm. and what's the impact. Right. So how's that impacting on their, on their world? You know, there's a difference between a child who's anxious prior to a test, um, but who can go in and write the test, and a child who's anxious prior to a test and isn't able to get out of bed to go write the test. Right. Or gets there and um, isn't able to perform to their, to their capability. Um, so those are the kinds of questions that we ask at, at intake. Uh, to get a sense of what is it that, that is going on, what's the intensity, the frequency, um, what would the goals be? What, right. what sort of help are they looking for? And then I always like to ask, what are the strengths? Um, Absolutely. What are the strengths? What are the interests? So if we have a child who's really uh, interested in art, um, then I'm going to pair them with one of our therapists who uh, tends to use art or has the ability to be able to use art as a modality. Uh, so that there's some kind of an interest that I can pair the child and the therapist with. 
um, so that it's easier to engage and so the child can feel more comfortable and more relaxed with the therapist when and, they come And if the you door. have a teen who comes in and says, yeah, I'm just here because my parents made me Absolutely. and I really don't want to be here. I get that all the time. Yeah, uh, of course. How do you I negotiate say, that? I, absolutely, I say to them, you know, they're like, I don't want to be here. <laughs> and normalizing that for them. Very few teenagers do we have that walk through the door and say, yes, I'm here for therapy today. Um, and just helping them to feel relaxed. Uh, I think helping them to understand that this is their agenda, not my agenda, even not their parents' agenda. Um, so how can they make it their own? This is yours. What do you want this right. to be? Um, I always like to ask the question of um, why do you think you're here? Why do you think the adults want you to be here? Um, so that they have some sense of ownership. I think for a lot of adolescents, they don't have a space where they can go and really feel that they can talk openly and non-judgmentally um, and in a confidential matter. Right. Um, and so therapy provides all of that. Um, and so we explain that to the, to the kids that come through the door that you know our ethics and our profession governs us um, unless we're concerned about self-harm um, right. or risk, risk to self or others, that everything that they say is confidential. Right. Uh, and we're not here to judge or say, um, you know, you need to this or you need to that. Uh, and that really helps the adolescents to be able to relax and provide them again with an experience they don't typically have anywhere else in, in their world. Um, and so after a few sessions, uh, and we always will say, you know, can you give us three sessions? Can we just, can right. we just try? Let's just commit to three let's and just then commit to we'll three have a and let's try. Um, and again, using modalities and, and interventions that they enjoy. So uh, poetry, if they enjoy, you know, lots of, lots of adolescents or music. Um, we had one adolescent who uh, enjoyed makeup, and so we had a mannequin. Um, and awesome. so, yeah, and so art was expressed and feelings were explored. And while they were doing um, things, they were, they were starting to process. That they were starting to process. So um, that creative venue of, of play and whatever modality that looks like, uh, we have some adolescents who love drama. And so to come in and role play and to be able to act out um, a scenario on? that's taken place for them or how they're struggling with something. Great examples. Um, yeah. And That's so awesome. when they leave at the end, it's like I often will say, so is this what you thought therapy was going to look like? And they'll say no. Um, and uh, it's a great way to have them just in, engage and engage. become part. Okay. Thank you so much. We're going to, I'm going to invite our, our viewers to grab a cup of coffee or a glass of water. Um, uh, come back. We'll be back in a few moments. And we're going to talk about other things adolescents and families can do to support wellness and then what exactly might happen in a play therapy room, what it might look like. So come on back after a break.